Hello and welcome to Ask Your Academic uh, webinar session. Today's session will cover our MSc Global Mental Health and MPH Public Health. We're joined by our programme leads, um, so that's Dr Julie Langan-Martin and Dr Sharon Greenwood. We will also hopefully have uh, Margaret from our PGT administration team joining us um, shortly. So thanks very much to everyone that has submitted uh, their questions ahead of today's webinar. Um, during the session, if you have any further questions, if you use the chat box, we'll try and keep an eye on that. And if we've got time, we'll answer any further questions that come through. If afterwards you have any additional questions, you can send those to the administration inboxes for your chosen programme. I'll pop those links into the um, chat box so you've got them but um, you can also find them on the programme web pages on our website. The session today has been recorded. Uh, that will be sent out in, in a few days um, after today's session, just to allow you to rewatch it if there's anything that you might have missed. And um, so we do only have 30 minutes on the clock, so if it's okay, we'll get started with our questions because we do have quite a few. So our first one is um, for the Master of Public Health programme. May I bring the data from my home country for the dissertation project? It's a really, really good question and something that we have um, been asked quite a few times. The concerns that I would have with this is about, about the ethical of obtaining of the data. So um, I, I don't, I want to err on the side of caution and not provide a, a concrete answer, but I think it's something that would need to be discussed on a case by case basis, but I'm more than happy to have a discussion about that one-to-one. Um, -one. Again, it would be, um, the, the main concern would be about the ethical issues around that. Thank you. Um, what are the job opportunities after the Masters in Public Health? There's a really wide range of job opportunities um, after the Masters in Public Health, and certainly a lot of our graduates go on to do things to do specifically working in public health, working for um, government bodies across the world, working for intra or global organisations such as the WHO, the UN. Um, probably most likely a lot of our, our graduates actually go in to do research and actually get involved with either third sector research, so charity based work, um, or work with um, different organisations, as, as I said. And certainly I know that some of the students that I worked with last year have now moved on and they now work for the Scottish Government, they now work for um, charities. One of uh, the students actually, who was an international student, has um, had a fantastic opportunity and, and is now working um, for a, a, a large Scottish charity and is, is really having a great influence there. So it's, it's great to see that. That's great. Uh, Julie, I don't know if there's anything you would like to add for the Global Mental Health um, programme. So I would just kind of echo what Sharon has said so far that, you know, there's a wealth of opportunities and um, destinations that our graduates go to after completing the Global Mental Health uh, Master's programme. Like Sharon, we've got a lot of students who've who work for universities, for example, who go on to do PhD students, to, to go on to do PhDs. Some students go and join the Declan Sci, so the Doctoral and Clinical Psychology Programme. We've had a few students go on and do that. Um, other students work for third sector organisations for the Scottish Government. We had one um, student who did an internship with the WHO, so it's really, really very varied. And there's lots of opportunities um, following the MSc. Great, thank you. Um, for the MSc Global Mental Health, are there any um, internship attachments? So we don't have any specific um, internship attachments specifically for global mental health we do have an opportunity for two students to undertake a kind of observe, observation placement with the Glasgow Psychological Trauma Service and um, which is part of the National Health Service so part of the NHS so in semester two and semester three we have um, a kind of competitive entry sort of application form to this um, cl like clinical placement and that's very popular among our students um, but other than that we don't have any other internships attached to the Global Mental Health MSc. Great, thank you. Um, is it possible to attend lectures on a course for additional knowledge, even if you do not select it as an elective? 
Um, we've not got a program specific, so Sharon, I'll come to you for that one first. Yes, uh -huh. as long as it uh, um, kind of ties in with your um, with your timetable. Um, Margaret, who's here, she's in she's in the, the chat. She can't get access, but Margaret is our fantastic um, administrator for the, the Masters in Public Health, um, and we we strive to get access to um, all students. So if they want to take on a course and audit a course, that's absolutely fine. But our priority is making sure that you can take uh, undertake the courses that you're interested in um, and that you want to take for credit bearing courses um, at the time that suits you. So yeah, that's that's there is the opportunity to do that. Great. Julie, I don't know if there's anything you want to add on to that. No, so absolutely, you can audit a course, as Sharon says, where it doesn't have any credits. And um, we obviously give priority to students who are actually taking it as a credit bearing course. So sometimes in terms of room bookings and, and whatnot, there might be a cap just in terms of the physical environment. But um, absolutely, we always um, do our best to accommodate students who want to audit other courses. Um, do we need to prepare anything academically or otherwise before starting the course? Um, Sharon, can come to you for that? I would say no, but I would also strongly encourage you to just engage with um, the wider world and what's been going on in the in the press. We're we're living in an unprecedented situation through a global pandemic, which is is arguably one of the biggest public health um, situations that we'll probably experience throughout any of our lifetimes. Hopefully, it will be. Um, so I would be engaging with, with what's happening in the world, reading some of the commentary, some of the fantastic academic blogs that exist out there, um, the brilliant TED Talks and things that, that can help you prepare for, for a, a good start for when you start um, the programme in September. Great, thank you. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the specialisms for the Master of Public Health and when we're expected to decide our specialisations? Yes, so we have four specialisms um, for the Masters in Public Health. We've got Health Economics, Data Science, Health Promotion and Epidemiology. And tied in with each of those specialisms is a core course and your project must touch on something to do with the specialism. Margaret and myself were talking about um, the dates. We don't have a date set for when you need to decide your specialism, but we do have um, a rough ballpark that we would expect you to decide halfway through semester one um, that, so that we can prepare and make sure that we've got the adequate resources. Um, this is also because you start to think about your project quite early on in semester one. Um, and we start to prepare a proposal. And if you are doing a specialism, we need to make sure that you've got um, enough focus of your um, specialism within your project. Um, if you do a specialism, obviously that then reduces one of your optional courses in semester two. Um, so you only then get the additional choice of two extra courses. If you stick with the masters in public health as a more general uh, masters, then you get three options. I, think, I don't know if it'd be worthwhile passing over to Julie because there's also specialisms for the global mental health. Well. Yeah, I actually think that's one of the next questions. Oh, is it? <laughs> it nicely, Julie, if you want to answer that one. Absolutely. So um, we have three specialisms for the Global Mental Health Master's programme. So we have a specialism in health promotion, a specialism in health technology assessment and a specialism in research methods. So it's slightly similar to the MPH in that we encourage students to think about enrolling in the specialism in kind of halfway through semester one, because as Sharon says, that impacts on your project and it obviously impacts on the core, you know, the core courses that are required. So we're slightly different. So if you're doing a specialism for global mental health, that means that you only have one elective course, all the rest of them are core courses for that specific specialism. Um, so really we encourage students to start thinking about their specialisms, you know, within halfway through semester one, just so we can ensure that they're, you know, registered and enrolled in the right courses and that the project is aligned to their specialism as well, because that will impact on their supervisor as well in terms of the matching process. Great, thank you. Do you have any advice for students who are returning after a few years break from be being in full-time education? 
that's quite a, it's quite a hard one. And I think a lot of our students do struggle coming back um, at first. And I think it can be quite daunting, particularly if you've been in the world of work and you're going from a very set nine to five job um, coming to um, academia and, and coming back to study where, where it is much more fluid. Um, you maybe only have, uh, you know, under 10 hours of contact time a week in terms of your, your top modules and things. And actually, you know, getting used to that is difficult, but it is doable. And I would def definitely encourage um, making friends on the course, having a good network on the course. And it's definitely something as program leads that um, Julie and I are very keen to kind of help foster and, and, and having that, that element of solidarity between um, your, your peers. Yeah, Julie, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, so I think we do, as Sharon says, we, we do have a number of students who take time out, go on and do kind of, you know, they work full time, maybe have a family, things like that, and then come back to kind of studying and things like this. And I think people are can be naturally quite anxious about this. And obviously things have often moved on in terms of technology and whatnot from when they were studying maybe their undergraduate degree and things like this. But what I would say is that, you know, we're here to support you. So no question, although you might feel it's kind of a small question, you know, you can ask any questions. We are open to helping and no question is, is, is daft or, you know, shouldn't be asked. We're definitely here to support you with that. What I would say is definitely attend some of the... So we've got the LEADS, which is the Learning Enhanced Academic, I can never get the acronym quite right, but we have a LEADS um, service at the uni that helps with kind of student writing and academic practice and things like this, and, you know, using references properly and these sorts of things. And I think that's really important for students who've maybe had time away from academia. So I would definitely encourage um, everybody actually to just engage with these resources because they're excellent and they really will improve your writing practice and how you reference appropriately and these sorts of things. So I would definitely say one of my top tips would be get in touch with leads and you know you can attend their courses or you can book one-to-one -one kind of appointments as well so definitely do that especially if you've been away from from academia for a number of years just as a refresher just to kind of remind you how to kind of act you know write kind of academically and things like that thank you um for yourself sharon and um, can we have more details about the research project and dissertation for top program will there be enough time to conduct a study I mean, this is uh, the, the ultimate question, isn't it? I mean, is there ever any enough time to uh, complete a research project? Um, the, the way in which we, we focus um, our students and we try and encourage our students is to have a really feasible research question that can be achieved within the set time frame. Um, so we, we, focus, we work with our students. We, every student will have a supervisor, an academic supervisor, who will help them. Um, revise their research questions to make it a feasible, achievable aim. Um, the thinking about the research project starts in semester one, as we've said. It becomes a bit more fleshed out in semester two. So if you are doing something that requires ethical approval from the institution, that's when we would be seeking to get your ethical forms and everything in place so that when you're ready to start your project, when it comes to the third uh, semester, which we call it's the third semester but it, it, it occurs just after Easter um, that's when you are focusing entirely on your project so you spend all of your time working on your project so that's that equates to about three months uh, full-time work on your project um, the project at the moment is 10 to 12 thousand words um, and again thinking about it as a training procedure it's, it is you are assessed on the document you produced, but it's about the growth that you go through that whole process. Thank you. And for yourself, Julie, are there any qualifications in this field that will help me to improve my professionalism and advance my career? So does that mean in addition, obviously, to the Global Mental Health Master's Programme, is this what we're thinking about? Or I'm not 100% clear on that. I don't really any more details. I think we could go with that. Okay. So, I mean, I think there's lots of different um, qualifications that you could do potentially after the, the master's programme. It very much depends where you see your career going. And because we have, we're so fortunate that we have students from such diverse backgrounds and diverse geographies that it really depends 
where they see themselves going. So if students are really wanting to go into research and do a PhD, then we're, you know, we support them in doing some of the kind of training programs that they can do at the university in terms of thinking about how you manage data, referencing these sorts of things, you know, the writing courses I've talked about through Leeds. But if you're wanting to have a much more kind of clinical like um, career, for example, if you're wanting to go on and do a doctorate in clinical psychology, or if you're from a nursing background or from a medical background, and you're wanting to go potentially um, into kind of management and things like this, then the MSc can be useful for, for that as well. So it really depends where students see themselves going in terms of what they're wanting to do and how they can build up their kind of CV and their portfolio aligned to where they see themselves going in kind of five, 10 years. Thank you. And could you tell us more about the examinations for the different programmes? Um, so Sharon, do you want to question? Yes, yeah, so we, we have a range of different assessments that we, we do. We've, we're trying to move away from exams and certainly for the MPH, um, we actually only, well, coming this coming year, we will only have one exam. Um, we're trying to move towards doing things that are a bit more practice-based in terms of essay writing, report writing, um, statistical skills, uh, course assessments. Um, in semester two, we actually, there's some courses that use some quite creative methods of assessment. So one of the courses I run does a, a social media assessment where, uh, where students have to prepare something that would be suitable for social media. Um, we also have uh, courses where students prepare posters. Um, and these are all skills that you hopefully will be using your, your in your graduate careers. So knowing how to communicate with different audiences is a really, really important thing in the field of, of public health and, and certainly in, in global mental health as well. Julie, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so just as Sharon says, every course has its own kind of assessments um, and, you know, there has been a general trend away from exams and we really try in the Global Mental Health Programme to align our assessments with the graduate attributes to ensure that students are developing transferable skills that are going to be helpful for them in their future careers, you know, in the workplace or if they go into PhD studies. So, like Sharon, we've got a range of assessments. So, for one of my courses, for example, students will design an information sheet about mental health, you know, a mental illness of their choice think about um, you know how that's treated we ask students to design posters record presentations and um, create podcasts and we still do have some essays as well within the global mental health program so it really is a, you know a really diverse um, range of assessments and as well another thing that we certainly do is we we've moved away from these kind of high risk assessments where say for example there's an exam worth like 100 percent of the credit you know, and if you have a bad day, then that, that has a really impact, a really huge impact on your kind of overall um, grade for the course. So certainly most of our courses tend to have two forms of assessment, each weighted usually kind of 50-50. And that just helps spread, I suppose, the workload over the semester for the students as well. And, it, you know, it's moving away from this kind of high, high stakes assessment as well, which I think students, and certainly that's based on their feedback that they prefer, you know, more assessments in some way <laughs> that are less kind of high risk um, and kind of, you know, play strategically throughout the semester as well. Just to touch back on what you're saying there, I think it is, it's really important that actually remembering that, that there's a lot of diversity within that and just, it's, it's students really enjoy that. Thanks. And um, I'm just looking at the chat box. We've actually got a few, uh, or the Q&A box, we've got a few questions coming through. So, and um, just, we've got 10 minutes left, if we could maybe jump on to some of them. <clears throat> so we've got one, can you talk a little more about how detailed the courses are? And um, for example, what is the level of information that's covered as the number of classes in the MPH programme is lower than other programmes? So I am a little confused about this question. Um, so feel free to clarify in the chat or to ask another question if I'm not answering it properly. Um, I am interpreting this as like you're comparing it to other programs that exist within perhaps university structures. So there might be courses that offer labs, there might be courses that offer um, other types of learning. Certainly in the MPH, we offer a variety of different contact time throughout the, the week. And it's you'll have your face-to-face -face classes, you'll have uh, individual study time sessions, you'll also have a, um, you also have various different approaches. Um, I, I 
kind of resist the <laughs> the quantifying of it. It's, it's about the quality of teaching that you get rather than the quantity. And certainly um, we provide a lot of resources for self-directed learning. Um, when you are engaging in a postgraduate talk course you do have to do a lot of reading and that is a personal task it's not something that any academic can just instill the information in you so um it's a central part of of the of the approach thank you and um, so another question from our chat box could you please speak more about in more detail about the nph health promotion specialism yes absolutely um and I noticed that the same person's also asked about the health promotion PhD program. Um, and I'll answer both of those. Um, the MPH health promotion specialism, everyone in the Masters in Public Health does the same three core courses in semester one. And so that is introduction to statistics, introduction to epidemiology and principles of public health. In semester two, as I've mentioned, that's when um, people take more optional courses. And one of those courses is the health promotion course. Um, the health promotion course is a, um, a 20 credit course that runs in semester two. Um, and it's very focused on lots of different elements about health promotion. And, and our course lead for that, Sue Campbell, is fantastic at, at um, delivering that course. Um, in terms of how that relates into the specialism, again, it's, it's thinking about the ways in which we can think about health promotion as a public health activity. How can we promote the health of populations? Um, we would expect that your research project focuses on some aspect of that um, in order to give you a, a good opportunity in terms of your graduate experience. And I hope that answered your question, but if not, please let me know. I'm just looking to see what else we've got. Is it feasible to do hands-on learning experience like an internship while in classes? And if so, can the programme help find those opportunities? So I don't well, know, Julie, you want to talk about that first because you'd mentioned it briefly. Yeah, so, I mean, I suppose, I think I always try and remind students that this, you know, it's a full-time master's programme, so it is a really busy year um, and the time goes really quite quickly as well. So I would say that is, you know, it's really important to remember. So although, as Sharon says, you might not be in nine to five every day having face-to-face -face lectures and things like this, we do kind of expect that students are roughly studying or spending time, you know, kind of nine to five, you know, five days a week working on their assessments, maybe you know, doing extra readings, familiar themselves with the literature surrounding whatever kind of research area they want to they want to um, undertake for their project. So I know as well, though many students do work during the master's programme, and it's always about managing their time and their well-being as well. So making sure they're not kind of burning out and you know overworking things like this. So going back to kind of internships. So some students, um, as I mentioned, we have the two you know placements with the psychological trauma service, which um, are clinical placements and it's subject to the, the correct visa um, stipulations are in place and the Disclosure Scotland as well. So those are the kind of two things that need to be checked before students can then go and undertake the, the placement. We do have good links with third sector organisations. Um, so, because we recognise that we're doing a lot of the the theoretical learning, but sometimes students want hands-on experience. So we do have these links with CARGOM, which is um, a third sector charity organisation where um, students can do some training with them and become a kind of paid, um, you know, kind of worker that does support for people with um, severe and enduring mental, mental illness. So there is opportunities to do that. I wouldn't really call that an internship per se. That tends to be paid employment with obviously appropriate training in place before then. And then we have the two clinical placements, but no other internships um, other than that. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but hopefully, hopefully it does. Mute. Another one that we've got there is, uh, is there any way to get in touch with other new students before the start of the course? So generally, sorry, I'll jump in there if that's all right. So yeah. we don't have um, personal contact details for any of the students or anything like that before they start because of GDPR. So we don't, we're not able to kind of share students 
uh, you know, contact details before that. Certainly, my experience is that very quickly students will create their own WhatsApp group um, and then begin to, you know, communicate with each other just right at the start of the semester. And that seems to work really efficiently. But unfortunately, there's no way that we can put people in touch with each other before um, the course starts, unfortunately. I think, sorry, to just jump on that and to add on to it, we also have the induction week which is the, the week before teaching properly starts and um, where you do have the opportunity to meet your peers and to meet other people across the college um, across different programmes. So, um, you know, that's a, the point to kind of engage with all the different activities on offer um, and get to know your peers. Great, thank you. Um, and I think this potentially might be our last question just in this chat box. How does the MPH teaching syllabus schedule change for part-time study? So this is a really great question and you can do part-time study for both on campus and online. Um, part-time study um, it very much depends for the on campus MPH, it depends on your workload ability. So most students will take it over the course of two to three years. Um, they may take one or two courses per semester. Um, and generally the research project is carried out over the, the proportion of either their second year or their third year. Um, and they spend a longer time doing these things. Um, it's something that we can work with you and, and have those discussions. If uh, the flexibility is more of your, your aim, then actually some of our online programme is actually probably better for you. Um, most of the online content is self-directed learning where you are supported in what we call an asynchronous fashion. So you don't need to be there at a specific time. You don't need to be there at a specific day. You can study when it suits you within a certain time frame within the year. Um, and you will be supported by the academic staff um, on a week by week basis. Um, so if that's something that is of use to you, then that's that's we definitely encourage that. And we are um, keen to make sure that um, we support part-time learners. Um, many of our, our learners are actually in, you know, full-time jobs and things. So um, it's it's something that is very commonly experienced uh, throughout the MPH. Okay, thank you. And um, I think that covers off most of the questions. Some of the questions we had were quite similar, um, but I think most of them are now answered, um, unless I've missed anything. I think there was maybe one in the chat. May I know how will be the classes of MPH and when we can take specialisation in MPH? Um, so the classes will start in the middle of September. I think that's what you're asking. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, taking the specialism, you probably would make that decision about halfway through semester one. Great, thank you. Well, we are now at um, the end of our session. It was very, very fast. <laughs> Hopefully you've all found that very useful. Um, if there was any questions that you've had and we've not managed to, if we've missed them, please do send them to um, the academic um, mailbox. Those are in the chat. And again, you can get them on the programme webpage. Um, we will prepare the video um, and send the recorded link um, hopefully this week um, so that you've got that to check back on. But we, um, in the meantime, we hope you keep very well and we hope to see you all very, very soon. So thanks again for your time, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.